while we're talking about child care and while we're focusing on the early years, really what we're discussing is a fundamental building block of care for our children as they move into adulthood. And we're talking about something that involves not just the care of the children, but really the care of our communities and really the care of our nation into the future. And I'm going to show you just a few statistics that bear that out and put it into some context. First of all, on the national level, three things that are very important to consider as we're looking at child care and we're concerned about the development of children up through adulthood. First, the fact that the deficit is increasing in this country. Second, the fact that our competitiveness is slipping as a nation. And third, that our education ranking relative to other countries of the world is low. And let's just take a quick look at each of these three. The New York Times a few weeks ago had a do-it-yourself kit for trying to fix the deficit. And if you wanted to participate in using that kit, this was the route <laughs> that they said you would have to traverse. And the point they were trying to make is that we face an, a, a huge deficit problem in this country. The way of fixing it is not easy. It's very complex. Wherever you push, other things get, get pushed around and pushed out, and opposition develops and so on. And it's not something that will have any easy fixes in the near future. It's something that's going to put us into a period of great austerity, us and many of the other developed countries of the world. A second national fact. You know that we have a large unemployment rate. You know we have a lot of people who say that they'd like to work. The problem is that employers are not able to match the available workforce with the skills that they need in positions. So another article, July of 2010, factory jobs are returning, but employers are finding skill shortages. The problem, the companies say, is a mismatch between the kind of skilled workers needed and the ranks of the unemployed. Looking to hire people who can operate sophisticated computerized machinery, follow complex blueprints, and demonstrate higher math proficiency than was previously required. Those are skills that are being looked for by the employers who are creating today's and the future's workforce. Third fact I want to bring out at the national level before we get, out, get down to, to Minnesota. And you may have seen these rankings. These came out this week from the, uh, they're the OECD international rankings uh, related to performance of students in science, in reading, in mathematics. Where's the United States in these rankings? Well, take a look. In science, we're 23rd, between, or behind high-performing countries like Slovenia and Liechtenstein and Estonia, and other places that you probably wouldn't think would be outperforming the United States if you were just off the top of your head to be naming better performing countries. Where are we with reading? 17th. Where are we with math? 31st. These are the figures, and as the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, said, you can quibble with these, you can start to say, hey, you know, you can't really measure things internationally, all the tests are not valid, and try to bury your head in the sand, or you can say, you know, the United States right now really is being out-educated, and it has something to do with the way that we're developing our children. So let's go to Minnesota. Three Minnesota trends that I want to mention. First of all, the number of low-income children in this state. Secondly, statistics, with which I think everybody in this room is probably familiar, so I'll just quickly show them, and that's that low-income children do perform more poorly in reading at math and math, and it starts at an early age. And third, something about the, the fiscal problems we're having in, the, in this state because of changing demographics. The number of poor children, kids 0 to 17 in poverty. In 1999, this was about 121, 122,000 children in the state. In the 10 years following, it increased by 43%. Also increasing during this time was kids above the poverty level, but still poor kids. For example, those eligible for free and reduced lunch. And admittedly, this number fluctuates. It was higher and lower prior to 1999. But the fact is, during this decade, it's increased 
by almost half. The gap I mentioned before, the middle line represents all children in the state. You can see that about four out of five kids at third grade are proficient in reading. That in and of itself may be a red flag. If one out of five at that early age are not proficient in reading, that's not necessarily good. But look at how much worse it is for low-income kids, the kids who are increasing in number. They're the green line at the bottom as compared with the higher-income kids, the blue line at the top. And then finally, spending in this state, the deficit in this state, the pressures that are going to be exerted on where we're going to need to spend money in this state. This graph developed by the state demographer shows changes in the three biggest population groups that exert demands on the state budget. And if you can't read the fine print, you can get it later, but the point is there's the 5 to 17-year-olds, the 18 to 24-year-olds, and the 65-plusers. They exhibit the biggest pressure on the state budget. Two things to note about this. First of all, the zero to fours aren't even in this list. So they're at least in fourth place. Okay. Second, who's predicted to increase in the next 20 years? It's this group here. It's the aging population, which is going to start to zoom up and be a bigger demander and needer of care and of state services. So that's a reality that we have to face. I'm serving on a state commission right now. But just in yesterday, we were going through our report about to issue some recommendations. Uh, and one of the paragraphs in this report talks about budget trends and predictions from the 2009 Budget, budget Trends Study Commission. And it's had a bunch of assumptions, assuming revenue grows X percent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it says that all segments of the budget beyond health care and K-12 over the coming years would have to be reduced about 4% each year to, to avoid budget deficits. This would nearly eliminate all other areas of spending, except for those two, by the year 2035. So as you're thinking about the early phase of childhood, it's not a rosy picture in terms of the resources that might be available and the politics related to the allocation of resources that could be available. That's why it's so important to have the discussion we're having today. And as I close my remarks, I'm borrowing something from uh, Jeffrey Canada and the Harlem Children's Zone, which describes the need to think of this as a continuum, the need to think of it as a developmental cycle, and as we're building programs to realize that early childhood programs are a fundamental building block for the entire career through which our children will emerge as young adults and adults in the community. And we have to think of every stage in that pipeline in order to be effective and to provide the kind of care that all of the children in all of our neighborhoods should be receiving.